What if I told you that after today's show, you'll be able to play any lick you want in any key you want by doing one single simple thing? Yes, it truly is that easy, especially when you know all about closed position, movable chords and licks. And that is the topic of today's show. So go ahead and grab your guitar. This is fixing to be a very powerful show for your guitar journey. Hey TAC family, welcome to episode 247 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is designed to inject your guitar journey with a weekly dose of fun, focus, progress, and inspiration. A little bit later on today's show, we'll be digging into some comments from some previous Acoustic Tuesday episodes, including a thank you from some folk greats and a perfect guitar journey quote from an unexpected source. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a moment. You're also gonna take a look at what the TAC family is working on. And yes, it is a movable guitar lick entitled Thumpty Dumpty. It's actually a stolen guitar lick from the bass guitar world. And of course, your weekly dose of acoustic news awaits, which includes some questionable new guitars, a captivating fingerstyle guitarist, and much, much more. But first, let's go ahead and unlock the fretboard with the notion of closed position movable patterns. I want to present to you this notion of closed position movable licks, chords, and patterns in a lesson behind the lick format. Now, if you've watched Acoustic Tuesday before, you may be familiar with this format, but if you're brand new, let me explain to you how it works. See, every Acoustic Tuesday show, I show you what the TAC family is working on. It falls on a Tuesday, the TAC family always works on a guitar lick on Tuesday. And oftentimes, I think every time, the guitar licks in and of themselves are really cool. It's a nice musical chunk that you can add to your playing. But oftentimes, these little musical chunks expose a much greater lesson. Hence, the lesson behind the lick. So in a little bit, you're gonna see which guitar lick the TAC family is working on. But prior to doing that, I wanna give you a little bit more context into the concept behind that lick. And today it is indeed closed position, movable scales, chords, licks, etc. So lesson behind the lick works as follows. I share with you what the concept is. I share with you what it adds to your playing. I share with you why it works. And then lastly, I give you examples of the concept in action. So let's go ahead and dig in. So the concept we're looking at today is closed position, movable licks, scales, patterns, etc. Now let's go ahead and define a few things. Closed position, actually one thing. <laughs> closed position means that there are no open strings involved. I'm gonna say that one more time in a different way. Closed position means that every single note is fretted. Let me give you a very quick example, and I think you'll immediately see what I'm talking about. I'm going to play an open position G major chord. Cool, great, it's an awesome chord. There are open strings. So if I move this, it starts to sound pretty crummy. Whereas a closed position chord, or really closed position anything, everything is fretted meaning I can move it. And it sounds good wherever I put it. Uh, this is true for chords. This is true for scale patterns. Uh, this is another example. I forgot the scale pattern, but you get the idea. If it is closed position, that means all of the notes are fretted and that allows you to move it wherever you want on the guitar neck. Okay, that's the concept. So what does this add to your playing? Number one, it allows you to explore any key you want without really having to think about anything. Number two, it actually allows you to um, create these wonderful riffs or licks that work over specific chords. And by virtue of them being movable, as long as you know how to name them, you can play the riff that you create over any chord that you want. Which brings me to the, the, the final reason or the final thing that it adds to your playing. And that is it gives you exposure to this notion of root notes and being able to name chords, name scales, name licks, you name it, you'll be able to name it. Meaning you'll be able to know what chord it works over and know what key it falls into. Pretty powerful stuff. So why does this work? Why do closed position movable things work? 
Well, the beautiful thing about closed positions is that since everything is fretted, the relationships between all of the notes stay the same, regardless of where you move it. So if I take a closed position phrase, right, those notes have a certain relationship. Since they're all fretted, I can move it anywhere I want and the relationship between the notes stays the same. So on and so forth. Now that's just a very quick example. Uh, speaking of examples, I've got an example for each of those things that it adds to your playing here in a moment. So go ahead, if you haven't already, grab your guitar. You're gonna wanna play along with me because this is extremely powerful stuff. So the examples that I'm about to play for you, the examples that I want you to play along with me are going to build one on top of the next in terms of comprehension. So it's gonna start out pretty minimal and then we'll start to add in some theory and some things that truly unlock the power of closed position and movable licks, riffs, chords, etc. Now I'll play a riff for you, but before I do that, I wanna define what a riff is. A lot of times the terms lick and riff are used interchangeably. And I'm just gonna throw out my definition so we're all on the same page. To me, a riff is a single note line that is repeated that contains rhythmic momentum. And I'm gonna use one that, that I'll consider a riff here. It's something that you can repeat, a small phrase that gives this sense of rhythmic momentum that works over a certain chord. Keep that in mind because that will become clearer and clearer as we go through these building examples. A tiered approach, if you will. So first and foremost, example one, how, how does, how does a movable riff even work? Well, number one, we have to define and make sure that it is indeed a closed position. So here's the riff that I'm gonna show you today. Here's the riff that I'm gonna use for these examples. Play that one more time. Pretty cool bluesy riff. Um, is that a closed position riff? Indeed, it is. Everything is fretted, so it checks that box. This is the definition of a closed position riff. Now we can have closed position chords, we can have closed position scales, but for the sake of today, we're just gonna use this notion of a riff. Just know that everything you learn will be able to be applied to, well, other closed position things, be them scales or chords. Okay, so we have this riff. Cool. Well, I can use this riff and I can, well, I can move it anywhere I want. And remember, it works wherever I put it, as long as I'm able to name it. And I'll go ahead and talk about that in a moment. But first I wanna show you something. I'm gonna show you the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel first, and then I'll show you how to get to the light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully that makes sense. So if I wanna play this riff over a chord progression, I can do that. In fact, I'll play it over a, a G, C, D, back to G, okay? And you'll hear it as I move this along, but I'm, you're gonna see that I'm going to move it so that it matches the chord. Okay, so first let's play it over the G. <laughs> Let me play it correctly. <laughs> Great, that works over the G chord. Now I'll move it to where it works over the C. And then where it works over the D. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna now play the chords and then I'm gonna play the riff. Okay, so I'll play the G, C, D and then I'll play the riff right after it. So you can kind of hear how those chords are insinuated with the riff or insinuated by the riff. So as you can hear, you're getting a different perspective of the chord progression. It is still that G, C, D, G chord progression, but instead of the chords, I'm playing a riff that insinuates the chords. Which brings me to the next example. Again, these examples are kind of building. We first took the riff, we moved it around, then we took the riff and assigned it to chords, but I actually skipped a step in the middle. 
on purpose because you're probably asking, great, I, I get this, it sounds cool, but how do I know that it works over a certain chord? Well, this exposes the notion of the root note and being able to name which chord the riff will work over. So if I look at this first position, or rather the first riff that I did in the, in the original location, okay, I see that that ends and, and has this sense of resolve on the fifth fret of the D string. And if I see what note that is, that is indeed a G note. So I know, because that riff resolves to that G note, that's essentially the root note of this riff. So wherever I position that, that will actually name the riff and tell me what chord it works over, which is why when I zoomed up here to the eighth fret, I know that that worked over a C chord because the root note is a C note. And the same is true for when I moved all the way up to the 10th fret. I know that that works over a D chord because that is the root note and it just so happens to be a D note. So that's how I knew that that riff worked over those particular chords. And of course we could do this wherever. If I position it on the fifth fret, that's an A note, that riff works over an A chord, okay? Now, this is true for anything movable, meaning anything closed position. I used a riff as an example. You can do the same thing with chords, right? Chords have a root note as well. For this movable bar chord shape, the root note is on the low E string. That's a G note, this is a G chord. If I move it up two frets, that's an A note, this is an A chord. If I move it up two more frets, this is a B note, it's a B chord. The same is true for scales, right? If you have a closed position scale, say if you're working out of a pentatonic scale, right? It starts on that low E string. The root is on the low E string. That's a G note, it's a G pentatonic scale. If I move it up two frets, the root's located on the low E string. That's an A note. That means it's an A minor pentatonic scale. Same thing up two more frets on the seventh fret here. B note, B minor pentatonic scale, so on and so forth. This is an extremely powerful notion, an extremely powerful lesson. By no means do I expect you to get this right here, right now. It'll take some time, it'll take some experimentation, but today we planted the seed. The more you know about this, the more you'll start to make connections while you play. It could be tomorrow, it could be today, it could be a couple weeks from now. But this is so important. I really want you to sink your teeth into this and really uh, maybe even come back to this episode of the Acoustic Tuesday Show because I think it will help you in a major, major way. Now, uh, speaking of helping and things like that, in the comments below, let me know if this did help you and if you had any light bulb moments as I went through this lesson behind the lick. Again, let me know in the comments below. And speaking of licks, now it's time to see what the TAC family is working on. And yes, indeed, it is a lick that is closed position, therefore making it movable. So if you didn't get all of this on this first pass, you certainly will in the next pass when I show you what the TAC family is working on. See, every day within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, the TAC fam focuses on one of the five essential categories of guitar improvement. Mondays is a technique challenge, Tuesdays a guitar lick challenge, <laughs> Wednesdays an improvisation challenge, Thursday's a rhythm guitar challenge, and Friday's a chord transition challenge. Yes, indeed, I already let the cat out of the bag. Tuesday's is guitar lick day, and here's what the TAC fam is working on. Your guitar lick challenge for today will no doubt have your head bopping and your entire body grooving, because it's a stolen bass line. It's a key of A blues bass line that we're going to adapt to the guitar. Bass players, sorry, not sorry. This works too well on guitar, to not steal it from you. So I'm gonna go ahead and steal it from you. We're all gonna go ahead and steal it from you. Um, let me go ahead and play this lick so you can hear what it sounds like, and then I'll break it down for you so you can see some other uses for it. Okay, here's how it sounds. <laughs> It's a pretty awesome lick. I named it Thumpty Dumpty because, well, the thump of the bass. 
because you can't ignore the thump of the bass. <laughs> and as I mentioned, we're taking this bass line and adapting it to the guitar. Uh, first, Tac Fam, if you wanna learn this note for note, please log in, this is your daily challenge. Uh, go ahead and click Start Challenge. You'll go right to the teaching video, you can learn it note for note, and then move to the play along video. Pick a speed that's comfortable for you, and don't forget to pull up the tab in a separate window by clicking that tab icon in the lower right hand corner. Okay, so this particular lick, yeah, it sounds cool, but it almost sounds like it leaves you hanging. It's like, it reaches the end and you're like, okay, is that it? What are we gonna do? Uh, this lick is actually meant to be repeated, and I'm not even talking about the entire thing. I'm talking about the very first measure. You can repeat this over an A chord in a 12 bar blues, and it functions incredibly well. You don't even have to play the chord. You could just play this bass line and it has the rhythmic drive, it has the notes that insinuate an A chord, and it works so well within the blues. Let me go ahead and play four measures of an A so you can hear how it sounds or how it would manifest in a 12 bar blues. Here's how that would sound. can't help but but bop your head. I mean, you can't you can't help but not get into this. You can't help but get into it. You, you get the idea. Uh, so you can repeat that over an A chord. And the cool thing is, is that first measure is completely movable. You want to do it over a G chord? Go ahead and move the root note uh, to a G and play the same thing. In fact, you can do that for the entire lick. Check this out. Do it over any chord you want. You want to do a B over a B chord? Move the root note to the seventh fret. Boom! You got it over a B chord. Over a C chord. Move the root note again. So on and so forth. It's just such an incredibly useful lick, and we're talking about just the first measure. A great way that this lays out is to play that first measure two times in a row and then use the rest of the lick for the third and fourth measure. And that would be your first, your first sequence in a 12 bar blues. It's four measures of A. So for the first measure, we have this. Second measure. And then we play the full two measure lick. Right, so it's it's just a fun thing to play with. And again, uh, bass players, sorry, not sorry, but uh, what you play on the bass works too good on the guitar to, to not rip it off. Okay, um, on, the same, on the same thought process as that, you know, I, I'm joking here about ripping off things and stealing things, but um, I was just surfing Instagram the other day and somebody had asked Trey Hensley a question about what's the best way to learn how to improvise. And he said, steal, steal, steal. And I thought to myself, this is a brilliant answer because it's true. Find your favorite player and steal licks from them. Maybe this lick is one of your favorites now. Go ahead and steal it. It's, it's really not stealing. What we're doing is adapting things that other people play so that we can learn the musical language as well. And rather than steal, I would think, I, I wanna change that to say honor your favorite players. Uh, you know, we all kind of have our hands in other guitar players' uh, bags of licks. Whoa, don't take that too far. But, but we all, as guitar players, we all are influenced by various guitar players. And, and it's okay to borrow things. It's okay to quote unquote steal things. That's not cheating, that's not copycatting. All it is is using what they play as a launching pad to find your own voice. So that's what I encourage you to do. Don't feel like stealing is bad. Don't feel like you're copying. Don't feel, it, don't feel like you're not being original. Use those other licks, those borrowed licks, as a starting point to start refining and developing your own musical voice. Uh, so huge thanks to Trey for mentioning that. And I just wanted to carry that message to you because a lot of times people ask, how do I improvise? How do I use these licks? Listen to your favorite guitar players. Listen to how they use them. Listen to what they play. And start to imitate that because you will, no doubt, carve, on, carve out your own little piece of the musical pie. 
<sighs> Let's go ahead and take a breather. We're gonna look at some comments from previous Acoustic Tuesday episodes. This first one comes from episode 234, where I talked about signature guitars, my favorite signature acoustic guitars. This comment comes from Eric Quinn, and he says this, love your videos, great stuff. Too bad you're a Blackhawks fan, LOL. I can take that lump, I, I deserve it. Um, we had a good run. It's gonna be a while before we're um, decent again. Uh, the next comment comes from that same exact episode. It comes from Ann E. H. Lint. And she says this, so interesting. Thank you for doing these videos. I'm a beginner and I'm looking forward to fitting into your very special community. My background is piano, a doctoral degree. I've wanted for years to learn guitar. I just bought myself a dove for my first guitar. I have already taken a huge step. Looking forward to many more videos and guitars. And welcome. And I wanna, I wanna highlight one thing from your comment. Uh, you said, I'm looking forward to fitting into your very special community. You're already here and you're already fitting in. You're very clearly a guitar geek and uh, welcome to the channel, welcome to the show, welcome to the family and welcome to your guitar journey. I'm very excited for you as are everybody, as is everybody watching the show. I'm sure all the guitar geeks walking, watching the show are excited for you as well. All right, next comment comes from the 12 string episode, episode 236. And this contains a quote that I found quite striking. Here it is, this, the comment is from Jesse Kidney. He says this, Tony, I've been working away on the TAC daily challenges and I'm really loving watching my skills improve little by little, so thanks for that. I read a quote yesterday that was attributed to Kurt Vonnegut telling a story about chatting with someone in his youth, just getting to know each other, and the archeologist said to him, I don't think that being good at things is the point of doing them. I think you've got all these wonderful experiences with different skills and that all teaches you things and makes you an interesting person, no matter how well you do them. That really made me think of my guitar journey and one of the quotes you read today about there always being someone better. This really made me think about why I joined the TAC family and how playing the guitar, for me, isn't about being able to play on stage with any of the greats or even to be able to play every song perfectly, but it's about connecting with friends and family and it's about having a great time learning something new. Thanks so much for keeping me inspired and connected. Jesse, what an awesome quote and phenomenal perspective into your guitar journey. And I think a lesson that, well, we all can, can take and apply to our own guitar journey. Uh, just, I, I got goosebumps reading that because it's so awesome to get in touch with the true driving force of why you play guitar and what it does for you. Yes, a lot of times we can set goals and it's really fun to achieve those goals. I mean, I'm not saying it's not, but understanding that there's this intrinsic value of playing the guitar and having it be a part of your life is really powerful and you're certainly in touch for that, in touch with that. So thank you for that comment. Uh, the final comment comes from uh, a, a very surprising person. Um, the comment comes from Kathy Fink and Marcy Markser. And if you're not familiar with these two, they are folk greats. I first was exposed to them uh, when I worked at the Old Town School of Folk Music and was blown away by their banjo and guitar duets. Uh, just, just really honestly, they are folk juggernauts. And when I saw this comment, I was floored because I was like, I really look up to these folks. They're, they're fantastic uh, guitarists, musicians, people. Uh, the comments from Marcy, she says this. Hi, Tony, I found your channel while, <laughs> I found your channel while looking up comfortable guitar seats. I bought a rock and sock stool and it is perfect. Thank you, Marcy Markser. Uh, well, you're welcome, and I wanna thank you for watching the channel, for watching the show. And again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Kathy and Marcy, you've gotta check them out. In fact, I found a great clip of them playing together. Uh, it's the song, Goodbye Ann. Go ahead and check this out. It's now time for some acoustic news you can use, and we're gonna kick things off by visiting the folks at Martin Guitar. They just released some new guitar models, and I'm not quite sure how I feel about them. Now, let me just go ahead and proclaim this from the mountaintop. I'm a huge Martin Guitar fan. 
I love Martin guitars. I grew up with Martin guitars. My first real guitar, my first guitar that I, I was scared to touch was a Martin HD 35. I still have it. I still love it. Now let's move on to these questionable new models. The first one is their 2.5 millionth guitar. Yes, 2.5 million guitars. First of all, a huge congratulations to the folks at Martin for producing two and a half million guitars. Wow, I cannot even imagine the scope of that. I mean, I'm sitting here telling you and I'm just dumbfounded. That's a ton of guitars. And for a single company to make that many, for a single family owned company to make that many instruments, is a true milestone. And they celebrated in rather flamboyant, uh, a rather flamboyant fashion. I almost said faction. Um, a rather flamboyant fashion. And at first glimpse of this guitar, I thought to myself, oh my, oh my God, this is not, no, 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 wrong, wrong. That's what I thought. That was my initial impression. But then I watched this video and it really put into perspective the thought behind the guitar. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, I'm glad you did this research because it explains a little bit behind this guitar and the meaning of it. So let's go ahead, let's take a quick snippet. Let's take a look at a quick snippet of this video. And uh, I think you'll see that some of the thoughts and um, I iconography behind this guitar are pretty darn important for not only Martin guitar, but for the guitar world as a whole. conversation had come up about what was the next big thing, what was the next big project that we were going to work on. And as I described some of the projects, uh, Chris and Diane said, well, you know, we have this jeweler and we would really, really like if we could come up with a story and can you integrate our jeweler? And their jeweler's name was Gary Orkheiser and we kind of talked about, hey, is there a way we can come up with something that we could really put jewelry on and make it something meaningful. And that's how it all kind of started. We own a piece of history that no one else in, in our industry and, and few in any industry can claim. And, and that is a known particular point in time when something really magical for the world happened. And that was the day that Christian Frederick Martin stepped off the boat in, in New York on November 6th. And I just said, you know, and you can put every star that was in the heavens that night and, and use various shapes of inlay material, whatever that was, that was going to be. Everything is possible, but what makes sense and what would visually present an, an aesthetically pleasing instrument. We're going to go ahead and stay in Martin land. I want to look at some of the other new models that they released at the NAM show. And I'm curious what you think about them. The first one we're going to look at is the D17 Squadron. Um, okay. I got to tell you right off the bat, this guitar is not my cup of tea. They do this printing on the guitar tops that while is cool. It's probably cool for some folks. Some some of you might dig it, and that's totally fine. No judgment here. For me, again, it's not my cup of tea. I feel like these particular guitars with the printing on the top will maybe look back in a few years and think, maybe maybe we shouldn't have done that. I mean, given that wood is a is a fairly finite resource and uh, one that is stressed to say the least, um, maybe maybe we can chill out on the printing. Just my take, I'm curious uh, of your take. Go ahead and put it in the comments below. Moving on to another new model from the folks at Martin. The next one I wanna look at is the DSS Hops and Barley. And uh, the, the caption here says, this pays homage to the special grains made famous for their use in beer making. Now, I look at this guitar and I think to myself, this is not my cup of tea either. However, I can swallow this pill because the inlay done on this is elaborate, it's delicate, it's very clearly expertly done. So it shows some true craftsmanship, at least from my perspective. So while this guitar is not one that I'd be, I'd be running out to get, it's one that I can certainly appreciate and it's one that I can honor the time involved. Now, if I contrast this with the printed top, 
I just I just can't get behind it. I I, I don't know. I I don't know. That's just my opinion. Uh, please let me know yours in the comments below. In fact, uh, this you know I've only looked at two of the models that Martin has released at the NAMM show this this year, uh, and this by no means is indicative of all of their new releases. It's just that these two models jumped out at me, and I thought that it would cause maybe some controversy, maybe some strong opinions in the comments below. So again, let me know your thoughts on them um, and other new Martin models in case uh, other ones jumped out at you. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're gonna go to Iris Guitars. They just uh, just posted this picture of a beautiful guitar that features an old guild top. Now, quite a few shows back, I let you know that Iris Guitars got a hold of quite a few tops that were made for the old guild guitars. These, these guitar tops have been guitar tops for a while and were just sitting there and now they're being put to use. Uh, and this picture is just gorgeous. The caption simply says, OG natural with an old guild top sounds so good. And I can only imagine having those tops sitting there and, and become uh, seasoned year after year after year, now putting strings on them and uh, uh, putting the vibrations through them. They probably sound darn good. I want to look at another guitar that knocked my socks off. One that I thought was uh, so well done and so so beautiful and so classy. It's a custom Taylor GA. And it's it's quite honestly gorgeous. They really took the Art Deco theme and put it all over this guitar, but not overkill. They really did a wonderful job of exercising some restraint and really treating this guitar quite classily, quite classy, uh, whatever the proper descriptor is there. This guitar has a black heart sassafras back and sides, an Adirondack spruce top, and just a quick list of appointments, Sapelli binding, boxwood Sapelli art deco rosette, boxwood Sapelli euro deco inlays, and goto 510 tuners, bone bridge pins with an iridescent Australian opal dot. Sorry, bone bridge pins with iridescent Australian opal dots. Um, just a guitar that, that knocked my socks off. I wanted to share it with you. Uh, let's go back to Martinland. They just released uh, a signature set of strings from Tommy Emanuel. Um, yeah, they just introduced these strings and the, the kind of, uh, um, I guess, big pro to these strings is that they're designed to reduce finger fatigue and allow huge bends. So I'm wondering if it's like a silk and steel kind of vibe where it has a um, maybe a thinner core, so bends are more achievable, maybe they're, they're lighter under your fingers. I don't know, I haven't tried them yet. Um, if you happen to have tried them already, uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. They're definitely on my list to try. I love trying new strings, although I always go back to those Santa Cruz parabolic tension strings because I just love them so much. They seem to be a great fit on all of my instruments. But again, I'm always curious on um, what other strings sound like, sound like. And of course, if you have thoughts, put those in the comments below. Uh, two more items for you. Uh, this next one is quite honestly, it's just a picture. It's just a picture of Muddy Waters and Eric Clapton. And I looked at this and I just thought, it's just so cool. It's so cool. I, I can't not share this. Um, so there, there's a picture of Muddy Waters and Eric Clapton for you. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, a fingerstyle guitar player that I caught by accident. I'm a huge fan of ear trumpet microphones. I use them here in the studio. I've got a pair of matched Edwina microphones, small diaphragm condensers that not only look cool, but sound great. And um, ear trumpet labs, they do these, these shop studio sessions where an artist comes in, plays through their microphones. And I found this video of, um, I gotta get the name correct, Brian Rahija. I hope I said that correctly. A fingerstyle guitar player that I watched this quite a few times because the tone that he gets out of this nylon string guitar is, is beautiful. And his compositions are uh, intoxicating, captivating. I, I just kind of sit there and watch and, and am amazed at what's happening. It's kind of the, the instrumental music that takes you to a different place. And I wanted you to know more about him. So let's first take a look at uh, just a snippet of that Ear Trumpet Labs shop session so you can hear what I heard. And then we'll look at a, a, a more uh, fuller song, if you will. Here's that quick snippet.
Okay, now you've gotten a quick taste of Brian Rahija's music. Let's listen to another song. This is a song entitled Three-Legged Buddha. Check this out. And I think on those beautiful notes, it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today, but not without sneaking a peek into what's gonna happen next week. Next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show, I'm gonna be listing off my favorite Epiphone acoustic guitars. Yes, my favorite Epiphone acoustic guitars. And you might think, finally, Tony's gonna feature some, some lower price, some budget instruments. And yes, indeed, I am. I'm gonna be sharing with you the Epiphone guitars that have knocked my socks off. Now, you might be surprised at some of these because, well, I don't think you'll see them coming. In fact, I don't think you'll be able to guess uh, some of the ones that I that I consider my favorite. So that's gonna happen next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time right here on YouTube. And before I let you go, please do remember this. Your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Thank you for being a guitar geek. And I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers, be nice, and play guitar.